we spent a dozen years together, and I still feel like it's just the beginning. Um, our sons who are with us tonight, which is wonderful. Where did they all go? They didn't slip out, did they? There's one. Where did the, where the other two go? Uh, restroom. Oh, okay. All right, they'll be back. Um, are always doing something new and wonderful. And of course, and with our new uh, daughter, Emery, and our new son coming, we have new things happening there. But every new poem of Laura's is a new beginning. Um, and when I read her first manuscript, when we were in college at Goddard College together getting our MFAs, uh, it was wonderful then, and it was wonderful just a few weeks ago reading from The Dancing Bear, the first book that came in the mail uh, over a glass of champagne. And that was a new beginning too. And I'm really looking forward to all the new beginnings that are going to happen as all of her manuscripts begin to get published. Um, She's continually outdoing herself, and that's one reason why I, I love her work so much. The poet Tony Hoagland recently spoke to her and asked her the question, are you happy with any of the things that you've written? And her first answer was no, and then it was maybe, and then it was no again, and that's exactly right. Um, in my mind, you should never be satisfied with, as an artist with what you're doing, always trying to do something more and something uh, pushing yourself. And I've always seen Laura doing that. Um, but while I may not be totally objective, uh, there are others who have commented on her work uh, who have great critical eyes um, and have said wonderful things about her work. Uh, the great writers Stephen Dunn and Lee Young Lee and B.J. Ward, who all read her book and reviewed it wonderfully, um, are not easy to please. Nor is the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, where she won a scholarship, or the Nebraska Summer Writers Program, where she also won a scholarship. Um, nor is the New Jersey State Arts Council, where she won a fellowship, um, and the dozens of magazines she's been published in over the last several years certainly are not, hard, are not easy to please either. So it's not just me saying these wonderful things about Laura's work. Um, at Brookdale, Laura is the co-chair of the Visiting Writers Series, and she's a co-advisor for the English Club. She's made a real difference for hundreds of students here at Brookdale taking them around the country to places like Chicago and Illinois and to the Dodge Poetry Festival. Um, she's, also the, uh, she's also presented papers on the confluence of science and poetry and pop culture. And uh, she's been a main force behind expanding the creative writing uh, options here at, at Brookdale, too. Uh, on a more personal note, if I can get any more personal than I have already, um, I'm really enjoying this new book with you and enjoying this debut. Um, and you'll have no other, pre uh, other introducer that says that they love you for it, <laughs> which I do, and I can't wait to see what else happens. So please welcome Lauren McCall. I don't think I'll ever get to kiss an introducer. You better not. Either. <laughs> kiss them all. Kiss them all. I, I couldn't agree more. There should be more public kissing. I have a poem about that, actually. I might have to read a kissing in public poem. I hadn't expected to do that. Um, while I'm... Uh, messing around here trying to decide if I am going to change my plans. Um, there's some people that I need to thank. One is Jill Zapankic in, in the back and Lauren Brutzman of um, Student Life and Activities for doing this, for organizing this. Um, you guys work with me a lot to bring the visiting writers and it's really cool that you're letting me be a little bit of a visiting writer tonight. So thank you. Yeah. The other person uh, that I want to thank is Colleen Lineberry. Colleen is sitting right here in the beautiful lavender purple. Um, she is the painter of the cover of my book, and I adore this cover. It's called Wild Blue. It's an acrylic painting. Um, she's also, uh, I wore this today, uh, a boutique artist. And uh, I, I really appreciate that your art is on my my cover. Do you have a website? Um, here at the college, but here at my art. English art. So. <laughs> well, get on it. <laughs> um, 
Thank you for being here. Um, there may be a couple people who haven't been to a poetry reading before. Some of my family are here. I don't know if you've ever been to a poetry reading before. So I'm going to just say a couple of things about poetry readings. One is that if you just read poem after poem after poem after poem, it's going to get exhausting. Like having 12 chocolate, chocolate milkshakes right in a row. By the time you're done, you're going to hate chocolate milkshakes. So there are two schools of thought in poetry. The first is, that's exactly what you should do. You're a poetry purist. You should just read the poems and not talk at all. I am not of that school. I think you've got to give a little bit of context and a little bit of a psychic intermezzo between poems so that you can kind of clear your head. A good poem is usually very packed and intense, a little bit of a, a psychic punch. You need to catch your breath. So hopefully, I'll make this a, not too terribly painful. We'll have a little bit of a, a tonal break. The other thing is that there's a, a little trend among poets to try to broaden the community of poets that people are aware of. And so some poets are starting to read other people's poetry at readings. And I'd like to do that at, to start off the night. One of the people who, who is a poetic hero for me is Lee Young Lee. And he did you know, give me a blurb. And as a little bit of a favor back to him, I'd like to read a very small poem of his. If you don't know him and you like this poem, then go Google, Google him. He's a great writer, a contemporary living master. His poem is called One Heart. Look at the birds. Even flying is born out of nothing. The first sky is inside you, open at either end of the day. The work of wings was always freedom, fastening one heart to every falling thing. So Lee Young Lee, wherever you are, we are evoking the gods of poetry tonight in your name. Thank you. Thank you for on Lee Young Lee's behalf. Uh, I actually have three poetry manuscripts, one that is published, and I will read some work from here. And I'll read a little bit from the other two, because just like children, and I have a number of them, you don't just love one, you love them all. So I will give you a, a little bit of, of each. In the Shadow of Rain. Beneath an outcropping of rock, the ground is dry. The sky heaves, and the rock might split. And though the water works hard to come around and down to soak you, it cannot. You are in a rain shadow and can't believe your good fortune. Around you, people are having their heads chopped off. Rape is, well, rape has always been. And the world creeps through its cycles, unaware of solitary human needs. In your crevasse, there is light, and things grow, but it is relatively safe. Reach across the demarcation that protects you and feel the wet thrust itself against your palm, so many stinging needles. Urchin of wind, you close your fist around, singing against the sound you fear, hoping to be heard through it anyway. If the noise could stop, you might be able to forget and rest inside this shadow. But the sound of hail pelting the world outside is so intoxicating, so blue, crackling with the static of electricity you envy, you'd simply die to just once. Feel the thump of it on your back as you run for cover. Thank you, thank you. I feel like Bill Maher. No, don't. <laughs> Radiation. Stand on the sidewalk with a cup of warm soup, curry the color of wheat in late August, and let yourself be seen. It's the currency of the street. Wear nothing or everything you own. It doesn't matter. They'll devour you with their eyes, grateful today for your humanity. What you see when you look back is the depth of space behind each cheekbone, the distance between the street and an open window where sadness lurks in the shape of a man fa found out today he can't have children. His face is luminous, 
the color of curry or yarrow, your finest eye shadow, the one meant to capture autumn. It's there in his eyes, more beautiful than anything. In the lot of the hardware store, someone watching you sees the color of your brother's car accident rolling off your shoulders like heat off hot tar in July. They recognize the smell of unresolved childhood grief, and it fills them the way good yeasty bread does. Let them look. You're busy. The man in the window is stretching now, his white chest wide, spine cracking, and with it, the odor of vanilla ice cream on a good man's beard when he kissed you goodbye. Turn away. Walk along the brick curb, radiating all the accrued sunshine you can on the surface of your skin like a body glove. Greet passers-by with a direct gaze. Be confident they see right through you. And if someone begins to cry, tell them a few blocks down is a man in an open window with a chest like a snowy day. Emmy is going to be my little marketer. She's going to make sure that everybody has this book. <laughs> I'm sorry if she distracts anybody, but it's so sweet. You know, um, everybody's got a 9-11 poem, and I do. But here in Monmouth County, it really, um, it really did hit home. I think we lost something like 60 people, uh, 60 families were touched. Um, the faculty here was very affected. The students were very affected that semester. And so I'm going to read for you my, my one and only 9-11 poem. I hope it honors something of our experience. It's called Physics and Grace. Welcome, he says, to the grand. The only admission, your postcards. Leave them in the bin by the coffee urn. His hand is a fistful of places we've been or endured. He thinks our sorrows are lovely in the grateful winter sunrise light. Maybe the dust in the air is evidence of the confluence of implosion and resurrection, or just sand blown in from the beach. There's a tension between the personal, griefs peculiar to each of us, a curbside morning when a good drunk finally went bad, losing a baby the day the towers fell, such a small loss on such a public day, maybe a son to a motorcycle accident, no war in sight, just black ice, and the public, like New York City the day after. Everything that doesn't die rises. We wait at tables, searching each other's faces, playing with our tools, forks, balanced on forks, the same trick practiced by all visitors to winter. He gives us pens, gold, azure, cerulean, crimson, tells us to write the morning you first remembered, you knew how to live. We laugh the kind of laugh that means we want to think it's silly, but no, it's exactly right. Tomorrow, the plan for ground zero will be chosen, metal balanced on metal, a latticework as fine as Japanese bakers amazing the world with a cherry blossom tree of bread from a country based on rice, and light balanced on the need to remember, light layered against light, blown up from the footprint as far as <coughs> physics and grace will allow, the particles of dust proof of what we've all survived. Um, this poem is dedicated to students, to all my students, and um, especially tonight to Johanna Coburn. I have to give it a little bit of background. Um, there's a fiction writer named John Gardner 
who is also known as one of the country's greatest creative writing teachers. Um, by the way, Jeff Ford, who's here, novelist Jeff Ford, and a professor in the English department studied with him, which is like blew me away when I heard that. So he got to work with one of like, the most famous creative writer, writing teachers in the country. But he also wrote short stories. And the short story that figures into this poem is a coming of consciousness about, about a young man. Do you know what The Art of Living? Does anybody know The Art of Living by John Gardner? In it, a group of young people are asked to dinner where they eat a dog. And I base the poem on that. So there's a little epigraph from the short story, The Art of Living. Then we were the diners now, this instant, sent as distinguished representatives of all who couldn't make it this evening, the dead and the unborn. You read the story? You oh, know, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I love that story. Go. It's good. Well, I hope, I hope, uh, hope it works without it. It should work without knowing the story, but if it makes you want to go read the story, that would be even cooler. Email me if you read the story. John and Maureen and Fred and Brian and Joe and Kelly, there were more. We dragged our chairs for one last time into a circle in Warner Hall for the final class that semester. Spring flung upon us overnight and not a moment too so soon. We were ready to kill ourselves that winter, but we're to discuss Gardner's story where the girl gets the boy to steal a black dog for the cook to cook in an ancient recipe ripe with meaning. There was the son who died in Vietnam, fallen hero, and the boy on a motorcycle quest of his own. <clears throat> All semester, John and Maureen led the class and helped Fred get the mythology behind it all. And Brian, who lacked the money for the text, borrowed it late every time. Kelly rarely said a word, and Joe bluffed better than anyone. All semester, I'd send them out looking for a dog. Then in class, I'd hack it, boil it, try to make a meal that might finally satisfy but it never did. Now, in the circle, a little mad, a little tired, I ripped the pages from the book and shoved fistfuls into each of their hands. I took a page and put it to my mouth, ripping off a good two paragraphs, feeling the surrender of ink. Who knows what toxins I ingested, but I swallowed. And then Fred. Yeah, he did it too. Ate a whole page. Then the others. The A students, amazingly last, were gnashing and swallowing wads of sopping words. I swear John Gardner was in the room and every English professor I ever had or wished I had. And though I have no idea if the students learned anything in that class or on that day, I've been told in the halls by students who've heard the tale that it was cool, really cool. <laughs> I didn't intend it when I wrote it, but I thought this would make a really good outcomes assessment poem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read a couple more from um, The Dancing Bear for you, but I want to just give you a little bit of my other work. My second manuscript is called What Men Want. It is dedicated, by the way, to my sons, Hunter, Luke, and Ethan, who are here. And they largely are narrative poems about um, not just literally what men want, although there certainly is that in poems about masculinity, but men want what all humanity wants. They want understanding, they want compassion, they want uh, empathy. So I'll give you a couple of those poems. The first is called A Horse Called Genuflect. Um, if you know the poet Elizabeth Bishop, she's also one of my heroes, she's not a living poet, and there is an epigraph by her for this poem. The art of losing isn't hard to master. You know it? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 cool. I love it. It's great. It's great. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. I have to preface this. I have to tell you something else. Uh, my son Luke uh, spent a summer uh, volunteering at a horseback center, a horseback riding center for the handicapped. Uh, it was a really fabulous summer for me. Um, I learned an awful lot about the human condition, the human spirit, um, not just about the people who came there, but about my son. I have a feeling Luke didn't think it was as cool as I thought it was, but I'm hoping in about 10, 15, 20 years he will. But Luke, I, I have to warn you, this poem is 
about that. Not about you. But isn't that cool that he did that? <laughs> At the Atlantic Riding Center for the Handicapped, the horses wait to be chosen. Size and gait for the right rider, depending on disability and need. The beauty of matching gorgeous heft to the sometimes exquisite deformity, though not often that, or deficit of the day. Today it must be autism, requiring a steady gait, and a, a steady and wide animal. Sorry. The small girl, a nebula of motion atop the beating universe of a horse called Willie, and multiple sclerosis. Sam the man, as the handler called him, wore an ice pack around his chest and loved the perky sadness of a horse called genuflect, named for his genial bowing down to let himself be mounted. How could I not cheer the analogy of bodies, human and equine, what made me know I've both wasted my life and I'm on the verge of breaking all the time? into laughter or sobs, like genuflect whinnying, like the barn cats who call as soon as I sit. Today one jumped on my shoulder, clung there, not clawing, just contracting her paw pads until my hands reached up and held her against me. For a moment, I loved this cat. Then I let her go. There's something you should know about me. I'm cold. I'm calculating. I get what I want. If you get in my way, I'll wreak havoc upon you. I can leave you weak, limp, twisted, confused. If you want to live to see tomorrow, you answer to me. And you answer quickly. I am a stroke. Learn to recognize a stroke and act quickly. Time lost is brain lost. This is fine. Thanks. Down syndrome. This is my life. It's not, not, I'm sure you all aren't used to this, but I'm used to a lot of noise in the background. Don't mind it at all. Balloons, footballs flying, it's alright. Makes it better. <laughs> it's okay. They had Brookdale Idol a couple weeks ago. She climbed up on the stage and tried to take the mic from one of the students. So this is actually pretty good. The boy with Down syndrome. Once on a ranch in Tennessee, on a wide morning when I knew it all, I gotta stop a second. Poppy and Melissa, you're gonna remember this. A little bit. This was in Tennessee, we went to Tennessee. Sorry, I had to do the family thing. You gotta give me a break on that one. Boy with Down syndrome. You gotta warn family, you know? Anything, anything is fodder and can show up in here, right? I'm scanning, I'm, I'm, I'm like making sure I didn't say anything bad about it. <laughs> Once on a ranch in Tennessee, on a wide morning when I knew it all, I asked for their most spirited horse. What made them think I could handle such an animal is beyond me, but I rode it out into the hills at the beginning of the Ozarks and it was good until, on the way back, 
My horse was startled by a jackrabbit and bucked me and began to gallop toward home. I clung to the side of the saddle, left foot still in the stirrup, the weight of myself more than I could bear. I was mute and the air caught in my throat, horse legs pumping near my head, hooves assaulting the ground. I couldn't right myself and so pushed off into the accommodating air. When I fell in the orange dirt, alone, miles from the stable, I lay there listening to the horse's hooves receding before getting up and starting the slow walk toward a day like this when someone I don't know and can't love beats against the carapace of my face with an unspeaking mouth. Few horses are perfect, gates like fingerprints for those who know. And when a horse is in full gallop, there is a moment, I'm told, when all four hooves are off the ground. Thank you. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I've been obsessed for about a, a year with um, something that's happened in science. And guess what? You're a captive audience, so I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> There's uh, a discovery of a brain cell called a mirror neuron. And what this brain cell does, and you need to know this uh, because it, it figures into the poetry, is if two people are both hooked up to a brain scan and one of them is to experience a feeling, say pain, fear, love, whatever it is, it's not that the person who's watching has learned physical cues or facial recognition of emotions. It turns out this brain cell triggers the same series of brain cells to fire in the observer's brain as in the person who's actually feeling it. That's mind-blowing. They're calling this the new science of empathy. I think it has a lot to do with the arts and how what you try to do in a poem or a song or a painting is to capture something primal that you've experienced and activate in other people their mirror neurons so that they experience it too. I've written a couple of scholarly papers about this, but I've also written an entire poetry manuscript playing off the metaphoric resonance of the words mirror neuron. Mirror, vanity, beauty, aesthetics, aging, neuron, intellect, mind, memory, good and evil. I'm just going to read you a couple of these poems to give you a flavor of it. I was told recently, you really don't know what you write until you've published. And then people tell you about yourself. <laughs> One of the things I didn't know about myself is that I'm apparently extremely affected by the news. And things in the news show up in a lot of poems. You may recognize what is in this poem. This is only about six months old. Under his cheekbones. Today they gave a woman a new face. The skin peeled from an anonymous man who left his body behind after something happened that changed everything. Those who love him miss him. Those who knew the lines of his face touch their own in hopes of recreating him. The woman who has his face, no doubt, will be told not to touch this new skin, the risk of infection too large. But under there, under this mask, she will be opening and closing her eyes. She will be breathing through her nostrils. Her tongue will be alive inside her mouth like a small pigeon lost in a cave. She will put a finger to her lips, which will part. Her teeth will pull small strips from the edges of her fingernails. This flesh, all she is allowed. Haven't you ever hungered for the edge of another's cheek or eyed the fat meat of a hand and wanted to test your teeth across the taut skin? When I press against my lover's diaphragm, breathing with him, my teeth against his flesh, it's all I can do to resist drawing blood. I'm told the woman was quite beautiful, a real charmer. Looking into her eyes, 
If she'd been close enough, I'm sure I would have wanted to bite her face too. Yeah. Whoa! Whoa! Uh, I'll, I'll pay you afterwards, and if you could come to every reading I ever do, that would be great. Man, that's exactly what you want. You want somebody to do just that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stay away from me. <laughs> oh, you know, and there's a terrible cannibal thing in the in the. You know, I should have been more sensitive. There's a terrible thing in the news right now. Uh, the next one's freaky too. Now, now I feel terrible. We're going to the dark side. That's it. That's it. This poem has a fruit in it. Um, does anybody know what a durian fruit is? Okay, durian fruit. Just want to make sure you know. It's it's funky. If you go to an, um, any um, more exotic market, an Asian market, um, a grocery store that tends to um, get more than just the standard stuff, it's very large. It's got spikes all over. It's really really cool. This is called wanting to open it and opening it. The durian fruit stinks like you killed your grandmother and stuffed her under the living room couch. Or the circuit in your garage got tripped and you don't know it, and when you go to the basement to get some bacon from the freezer one Sunday morning in August, you open the freezer door to this sudden knowledge. Or you come upon a dead deer. This is what the fruit smells like but it tastes like custard and breaks across your tongue like sugared pudding. When given the choice between beauty or truth, would you choose it if it would result in even one grief? Or let's lower the stakes. Not beauty, not truth, such abstractions. Just one small girl. Her name the same as the girl who lives in your mind. Her eyes filled with light. Her smell like a hot, humid morning. Her hand on your arm like laughter held back. What would it take for you to kill her? Don't tell me. Don't tell anyone. What is her life worth? What kind of sacrifice to the gods would she make? Rain in a drought year, the end to war in the Middle East, remission of your son's cancer. Who could blame you? Who could blame anyone for not eating fruit that stinks even after they knew the taste would be worth fighting back the instinct to wretch? God isn't here and Satan is asleep. So tell me the truth. Even if you knew what lay behind the door in the basement, would you want to open it anyway? I'm Graham Rahal, a race car driver in the Champ Car World Series. Whether I'm reaching speeds of nearly 200 miles per hour on the racetrack, or driving at home on the street, I always keep my hands on the wheel. Recent studies show that most crashes and near crashes involve some form of driver distraction. Please don't text while driving. The consequences can be very serious. Keep your hands on the wheel. Join me and my fellow drivers in the Champ Car World Series by taking the pledge at handsonthewheel.org. Yeah, I took a trip to Elkhart, Indiana today. Elkhart's a place that has lost jobs faster than anywhere else in America. And the people who've lost them have no idea what to do or who to turn to. In fact, local TV stations have started running public service announcements that tell people where to find food banks, even as the food banks don't have enough to meet the demand. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this? It's probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool. Really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. The mailbox and the traffic light. Both are ideas from the minds of African Americans support the United Negro College Fund.
because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, we had to put our family dog down not too very long ago, about, about six weeks. But about two years ago, we had to put the other family dog down. And this poem is for anyone who's ever had to do that. That's a tough, tough thing. It's called Moment. There's a moment in every dog's life when it surrenders its dogginess to a greater good. Maybe to you, if you're lucky and lacking the love of a good dog. And that becomes the firmament in the earthquake your life is. Loneliness can't enter through that door. Make your body a door. What is overhead bears down, and the shape of nothing becomes visible, like your dog in the corner who dreams silently, his legs pumping. This is what you recall when his brave blue-black tongue lolls from his mouth, so long, so thick, you are shocked, and you cradle it in your inadequate hands to keep it off the cold tile floor in the last moments of his dedicated life, weeping like a child with the silly hope you are the door he's passing through. Two more poems. Anybody a surfer in here? Any surfers? I know I have one surfer, or two surfers, three surfers. Internet right. surfers. Internet surfers. Well, I'm, I, I meant the physical. This is, this is for any of the surfers in the room. And I got up on my knees on a surfboard <laughs> once. 45-year-old old chick. <laughs> I did. I got on my knees. You saw me. <laughs> Between the board and the whale. Spiros Varnas. This is also from the news. You can go back. You can Google these things. Spiros Varnas was surfing one day in his 60th year. He started when he was 12. And so this was a life's work, if you will. And this day, something wonderful happened. Off the coast of California on a sunny day, what else could it be, a whale came up underneath him, lifting him on his board into the air so gently he never changed positions, though he reported a pinched finger where it was caught between the board and the whale. There were witnesses. This is no lie. And imagine that, working your whole life at something you love until you know it so well, the board is like an extension of your body the water like the air you breathe, and you ride the confluence of the two as if it is the only place you're really alive, and still something unexpected happens. Who knows what Spiros thinks, or the whale for that matter. Such things are not supposed to happen. But some days when I'm driving to work, I watch the sky instead of the highway and imagine the nose of my car tipping up, the wheels on suctioning from the road, and the kisses I feel planted on my cheeks in moments I am alone must be real. Leakage from a world where memory and sound and light break in waves on each of us, leaving residue like sand blown across a dune that doesn't exist. You know, I've read this poem, that poem a couple of times in other places, Austin, Texas, elsewhere, and I realize no questions asked. You read it here for people who drive on the Garden State Parkway. <laughs> you have to sell, tell them you are not driving and looking at the sky. So I don't do that. I obviously am watching the road. It's not meant literally. <laughs>
Every minute of every day, a child is born with HIV. Not enough mothers have access to AIDS treatment to prevent them passing HIV to their babies and keep themselves alive. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can work for an AIDS-free generation. Unite for children, unite against AIDS. Pump less. Come on, you could do better than that. You know you could do better than that. All right, let's go again. Yes! Properly inflated yes. tires can improve your Look gas mileage you. enough to earn you a you free tank of gas you, huh? every year. I told you you had it inside you. Answer the call. <laughs> this could be good. Hey, you. You're watching Brookdale Television. Um, my closing poem is dedicated to Bill Watkins in the manuscript. Um, Bill is not with us this semester, but he is a poet, um, a thinker, a writer, a, a man of great conscience. Um, he's a professor in the English department. But I'm dedicating it tonight to the guy who came to my reading on a motorcycle. So it's for you, Betty. It's called Witness. And it's my last poem tonight. And I, and I really really appreciate him and I'm honored that people would come out to listen to poetry and to support um, this very solitary um, act, the act of writing and making of it public um, is a shared event and I, I appreciate sharing it with all of you. Witness for Bill Watkins. Parkway's in here. You know, I have a feeling I have a lot of poems with the Garden State Parkway in it. You can't live in New Jersey without spending time on highways. Do you know every year there's like a big motorcycle event on the parkway? Okay, that's what this is about. 6,000 motorcyclists on the Garden State Parkway for their annual ride. A percussion across the new asphalt brilliant broken lines, crisp, enthusiastic demarcations on a map. All the non-bikers in their cars were miffed. Two lanes were dedicated to this procession. Or they were pulled over to stand in the noise and watch. Once in the Brigantine Wildlife Refuge, I saw 10,000 snow geese take off. It sounded across the wetlands like a stadium of people who'd seen a record broken coming to their feet in applause and cheers. The noise was the same as this. Every biker, an ambassador of his own country, a patch on a hundred mile ribbon of resistance. One biker slowed and smiled. His teeth were hyphenated lines across his face leading down a road only he'd driven. He waved at a busload of people heading toward Atlantic City to do what everyone does. I don't know if they waved back at him, but I did, as hard as I could, lifting up on my toes as if I were going away for a long, long time. If this was a security checkpoint in an unruly airport in the feral world, I would hide something of that day in my bags, deny I had anything to declare, wait for them to search me, and if caught, I'd rise, startled, innocent, guilt by association, demand amnesty or oblivion for every risk not taken, wager never made. This memory is a blunt instrument, dangerous, insurgent, like ambassador bikers, celebrating the state of their discreet countries, motors, the clamorous censure of the cultured world. Thank you very much.